Everyone wants to talk about it. We skirted around it. The decisions that Jamal Mosley made for game one and why they are a huge risk, plus more keys to game two, it's time for Locked On Magic. You are Locked On Magic, your daily Orlando magic podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And you are indeed Locked On Magic. Today is April 21st. It will be April 22nd, 2024. My name is Phil Prosmanreich. I'm the expert and site editor over at orlandomagicdaily.com. You can follow me on Twitter at philiprr underscore omd. On today's episode of Locked On Magic, we will talk about the lineup decision and the risks that comes with it, the Magic's decision to start Jonathan Isaac, what worked, what didn't work, and the trickle-down effect of it all. We'll get to that. Plus, how Evan Mobley forced the first adjustment of the series and your keys to Game 2. We're going to get to all that coming up here in just a moment. But first, we want to thank you again for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day, no matter when you listen to us, whether it's first thing in the morning, whether it's right when we upload. We truly appreciate you making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. Remember, there's a great Locked On podcast covering every single team in the NBA. Just search for Locked On and the team you're looking for. The Locked On Podcast Network, it's your team every day. Today's episode of Locked On Magic is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for $20 off your first purchase. We all kind of sensed something was up um, when Jamal Mosley did not freely give his starting lineup before Saturday's game. I remember I was the one that asked the question. You know, we we were all kind of wondering that. Um, You know, with the Magic starting Jonathan Isaac in the last game of the season, would they carry that over? Would they go back to the lineup that's tried and true, that sets the rotation up that, that the Magic have had for essentially the last 20, 25 games? Jamal Mosley wasn't volunteering an answer in his pregame uh, availability, and we got the answer about a half hour before tip-off that Jonathan Isaac would indeed start for the Orlando Magic at center, and Wendell Carter would come off the bench. This is this was a, to me, a huge risk. Um, I would argue that you know I've had a lot of people argue with me about Jonathan Isaac being a long-term center option. And I was like, I, I just. I don't know if he can stand up rebounding-wise. I don't know if he can stand up physically to some of the bigger centers. And Jared Allen certainly qualifies as a bigger center. Isaac, when I was asked him about it uh, earlier on Sunday, said, "You know, it's not like Jared Allen is a traditional back to the ba- back to the basket center. Most of his score, most of his points, he scored 16 points, grabbed 18 rebounds, only three offensive rebounds. Most of his points came from dump offs and 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 dump downs when when he had, when Isaac had to leave his man to go help the guards. I, I would certainly argue that Isaac overhelped and was a little bit a uh, block chasing a little bit, putting him out of position to recover to Allen, which I think he can definitely do. So maybe this is a matchup where something like that would work. And, and logically, too, offensively, not that Wendell Carter doesn't anyway spread the floor. Isaac does allow the Magic to switch a lot more. He does allow the Magic to be a little bit more versatile on the perimeter, uh, unleash that big size that the Magic have, um, but he also spreads the floor a little bit better, a little bit better as a three-point shooter and as an attacker off the dribble. So I, I think the Magic have long been trending in the direction of starting Jonathan Isaac, but to do that when he never did it in the regular season, he did it one game in the regular season, but to do that in such an important moment, I think is an incredible risk. And the numbers, unfortunately, bear out that for at least one game, it did not work. That starting group in 27 minutes on the floor during uh, during Saturday's game had a minus 16.3 net rating, 103.6 defensive rating, which is really good. Uh, but an 87.3 offensive rating. They got outscored 58 to 48. Maybe the sample size isn't large enough to to, to use the, the non-piece numbers. You're only going up against one opponent. They got outscored 58-48, shot only 34% from the floor. In a game the Magic lost by 14 points, and look, everyone struggled, the starting lineup lost by 10. They left the game in the first quarter down 19-9. In, in about in about five and a half, six minutes uh, of that first quarter. So if the goal for the Magic was to get off to a better start, which they absolutely had to do, and you know maybe this was just Cleveland's day, where, you know they were really focused, really intent on getting out to a good start. They had the momentum at home. They made some tough shots early. We'll get to some of that here in a bit. Maybe that's nothing to get worked up about. 
But the magic found themselves in that 10 point hole. And now all of a sudden you've taken away that big, big key for that second unit. The Magic have the fourth highest scoring bench in the league. Their 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 you know their whole kind of gimmick is not that gimmick, but their whole kind of thing is whatever start we get off to, the bench is going to elevate this team. Well, that didn't happen. Instead of being down, you know, you're down ten. That bench couldn't get much traction. In fact, you know, the Magic tried an all bench lineup. That was a mistake for for the five minutes that they were on the floor together. They got nothing done. Made, no, made up no ground. You know, Mo Wagner had a good game. Cole Anthony obviously struggled with his shot. But they really had nothing going with that all bench unit. And, and honestly, I would argue Mo Wagner is a huge key in this series. You know, he's obviously already getting under Cleveland skin. He got booed every time he touched the ball um, after that second quarter skirmish that he got involved with Isaac Okoro over. Um, he... I think you're cramping his space by having Wendell Carter out there with him. You're losing a lot of the defensive power of that second unit. Look, there's only one Jonathan Isaac to spread around. You're losing a lot of defensive power. And so I think that you're messing with the formula. And look, I'm all for experimenting. I'm all for trying things. I'm all for Jonathan Isaac getting minutes at backup center. I love that they tried that during the season. I love that they're trying him as the center with the starting lineup. I, the Magic have to maximize their Jonathan Isaac minutes. And unfortunately, Jonathan Isaac did not, you know, he would maybe disagree, but Jonathan Isaac did not play a great game on Saturday. Like I said, he was trying too hard to go for blocks. And look, he had three blocks, he had three steals. So it wasn't like he was completely terrible. And, and and once he settled down, the whole team settled down defensively, but he was chasing the game. Some of that's the guards were late and switching was bad and, and all that stuff, but he was chasing the, the perimeter and that left Jared Allen open. And, and that made that lineup so much less effective. What we know about that starting group, uh, and again, the Magic did their job. Second unit, the uh, starting group in the second half outscored Cleveland 21 to 16. So they... You know, they only got outscored by five in a game you lose by 14, but to get 10 of those points in the first quarter when the Magic fell behind, not not a good sign. The starting lineup with Jonathan Isaac for Wendell Carter played only 44 minutes together, so about a full game. Plus 5.2 net rating, not bad. 106.2 offensive rating, terrible. 101 defensive rating, elite stuff, like ridiculously good defense. The Magic just, it, you know, the struggle in this series or the struggle with this roster right now is the Magic know how important Jonathan Isaac is. And they know how important it is to whatever lineup he is in. And now they got to find the right way to use him, the right way to sprinkle him in and, and, and deploy him in these series. And look, there's only one Jonathan Isaac. And when you look at the numbers, actually, Jonathan Isaac and Jalen Suggs had the worst on-court defensive ratings of anyone on the team. 108 is still really good, by the way. But it was a weird game. The question, the question is always, it always goes back to the same thing. It's going to be our biggest key for game two is for as good as you are defensively, how much are you draining offensively? And, and, and I mean, this is kind of the bigger, larger question is, is there an answer to these questions on this roster? And, and frankly, the answer might be there isn't. You know, Gary Harris needs to make shots. Jalen Suggs needs to make shots. The guys the Magic are relying on to make shots need to make shots. It's gonna be, that's going to be our first key to game two, by the way. Um, but to me, I think this is too big of a risk. Um, you know, look, Jamal Mosley might know something we don't. Um, obviously, I think you need to play Jonathan Isaac as many minutes as you can, and I want him playing with the starters, actually. I want him in that lineup. I, I don't, I'm not even here railing against the starting lineup. What I'm railing against and what I think is the biggest risk is now all of a sudden, you are trying to put together a group that has not played even a full game together over the course of an entire season. It's 44 games, but that's maybe four or five minutes here or there over six, seven, eight games. You're trying to put together a group that has not played together very much in the most pressure situation. And on top of that, you're changing the bench. There's a trickle-down effect to this. You're changing that second unit. You're changing... Uh, changing how that second group plays together. And that's kind of been your superpower all year is if you're down, that second unit brings you back. If you're up, that second unit extends the lead. 
the starters are positive over the course of the season, but they essentially break even and then they tear things up at the start of the third quarter. And that's kind of what happened in this game too. So if, if starting Jonathan Isaac was meant to solve your poor start problem, you played the same way anyway, and you gutted your bench. This is, to me, at this stage of the season, too big of a risk to take. And maybe I'm just conservative, and I am conservative on these things, and, and, and I go with what I know is working. I think the Magic, you know, have made a mistake here. But this is the theory of their case. You know, again, this is kind of the theory of everything for this Magic team. They want to be big, they want to be long, they want to be versatile, and they want you to figure out how to get through all the arms that they put in front of you. Maybe, and the defense was fine, maybe this is just a simple case of, hey, make some shots, everything looks better, and that's probably the case with a lot of things. Maybe the issue is we got some things to clean up defensively, we clean those things up, we'll get easier opportunities on offense, we'll get out and transition a little bit more. Maybe that's all this is. But again, this is not the time to experiment. The time to experiment is the regular season. Maybe the Magic didn't have that luxury with where they were in the standings and the work they had to do in the last week of the season. And they did do some experimenting with Isaac with that starting group. He, you know, came in with the start with the to be the backup center there for the last month of the season. But to me, this is a big risk. Changing who you are. Again, the playoffs, you got to be who you are, but better. Changing who you are and what you're comfortable with. I think that was a huge risk for this Magic team. But it's the one that they're committed to now. Jonathan Isaac's going to start again game two. I, I have no doubt about that. That's that's the plan. And it's it's a big gamble that the Magic are making. Or maybe it's the maybe this is the experiment they want to run so they know what they need next season. Either way, that lineup has to perform now. And the bench has to figure it out. And everyone has to fill in and, and figure it out. This isn't the time to be figuring yourself out. You need to be figuring out the other team on top of that. Coming up, we'll talk about the adjustment that the Cavs made and why making forcing that first adjustment was the big key to the game. We'll talk about that coming up here in just a moment. But first, it's time for a quick word for our friends over at Monopoly Go. Yeah, I've been told that that I can be a competitive person. Like, you know, like I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm a little upset that the Magic lost game one, aren't we all? But the best part is we get to get back on the horse. We get to get back in the game. So we all have a competitive side. And if you want to get back in the game, your competitive side is going to love Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it. It's been downloaded more than 150 million times. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations building up amazing cities that bring you money. But the best part is messing with your friends. That's what we all want to do. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly, but now I can heist their vaults for riches for myself. And the leaderboard show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. That's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world in time tournaments to earn huge rewards. So get in the game and join your friends. Download Monopoly Go now free on the App Store or Google Play. Today's episode of Locked on Magic is also brought to you by our friends at Game Time. Game Time is now an authorized ticket marketplace for Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch with killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee. Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying Major League Baseball tickets. Look, it is getting to be time for the Magic to have their home playoff game. Uh... Game two on Monday, game three coming up on Thursday. And if you want to get in to see the Magic play game three of their first round series against Cap Cleveland Cavaliers, game time is the best place. You can see it if you're watching on YouTube, is the best place to get tickets. Because look, you can get tickets for as low as $107 right now as I'm looking at this. That is their big deal. They got flash deals for $120 in the lower bowl, uh, you know, $157. Look, game time is going to be your best bet to get to see the Magic play playoff basketball. That's the best part about it. Game time gives you 
Great last-minute deals. You can save up to 60% off buying last-minute for sports, concerts, comedy, theater, etc. So if you're waiting until Thursday to buy tickets, game time is the place to go. They offer flash deals that save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. All in pricing that features shows the total upfront with no surprise fees at checkout. You can get seat views, digital seat views of where your seat is. It's the best. I've used it for going to, ba- to baseball games, to going to events. It's the ticket app that I use, and you should use it too. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Again, terms apply. Create an account. Redeem code LOCKEDONNBA. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. We want to thank you for making Locked On Magic part of your day every day. We're going to have a busy day waiting around for Monday's Game 4. And if you want a recap of all the playoff action from Sunday and from throughout the weekend, Locked On Sports Today has you covered. It's a free 24-7 sports streaming channel program for you every day to bring you the biggest stories without the screaming you get from the national networks and with the insight and analysis of local experts who know their team best. Locked On Sports Today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. So, we're kind of new to this playoff series thing. It's been a while for the Magic to be in a playoff series, and specifically a playoff series that that we feel fairly confident that they can be competitive in. Um, you know, no offense to 19 and 20. Um, I think we all suspected that Raptors series was going to be fast. Um 2020, I think we all suspected that Buck series was going to go pretty quickly. Um, this is a team that can compete in this series. And obviously, we're going to talk about Game 2 here in a minute. And these series, these really competitive series, ultimately come down to the kind of bets you're making. It's, it's a gamble. You know, you can't take away everything. So you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to give up? Um, we anticipated. I mean, we talked about this a lot throughout the course of the season. We anticipated that teams would look at the Orlando Magic and they would say, we will give up three-pointers. If they make threes, we'll adjust, but we will give up three-pointers. And, you know, we'll talk about that a little bit here in, in our keys to game two. That's that's kind of how game one played out. The Magic defense is excellent. And they played a great game. You know, the defense did its job on Saturday afternoon. Again, maybe a bad stretch, start of the game, bad stretch end of the third quarter, but those stretches were only really bad because the offense couldn't do anything. Um, the Magic defense played really, really well and gave this team a chance to win. It was just about, you know, walking through that door. But that's also the point. Because um, each game is going to take on its own rhythm, its own own story. You know, we may have a, you know, I don't think we'll get this. Maybe we'll have a game where each team scores 110 or where a team gets to 110. And that game's going to have a different rhythm than Saturday's game. And so the rhythm of game one or the story of game one, everyone's kind of talking about Donovan Mitchell and, and his great and his great game. And I didn't think Magic did a terrible job on Donovan Mitchell. I think they got loose and, and Mitchell really pounded them when they got when their when the defense was bad, Donovan Mitchell made sure Cleveland scored. When Cleveland's defense was bad, Orlando didn't always make sure they scored. Like let's let's put it that way. That's that was that was a key in the game. But so much of that opened up because Cleveland made Orlando make the first adjustment. And this is the thing I want you to watch in game two. Who makes the other team change their defensive scheme first? Or change how they do things first? Because that's the team that's in control. The Orlando Magic were happy to let Evan Mobley shoot. You know, if you, you know, the Cavs talked about this a lot. That Evan Mobley being able to shoot and being able to hit threes and being willing to take threes is a big factor for them. Evan Mobley made two threes in the first quarter. Fairly early in the first quarter, too. The Magic tried to bring two to the ball with Donovan Mitchell. They left Evan Mobley open. They were like, we feel we can recover fast enough to contest those threes. And he's not a great three-point shooter anyway. He's actually pretty solid, 37.3% from three, but on just 1.2 attempts per game. After the All-Star break, he was down to 34.3% from three on 1.8 attempts per game. Were the Magic perfect on Evan Mobley even under the strategy? No. 
Um, they left him wide open, which they cannot do. But Evan Mobley hitting two threes early in the game, and he only ended up with three. Um, that was a humongous factor in this game. The Magic, no, that is not his game. He is not a three-point shooter. And the Cavs, they play Evan Mobley and Jared Allen together when they need stops, but that drains the offense because Mobley doesn't space the floor. It sounds sounds like a familiar idea, right? Spacing the floor, novel concept. He is not a floor spacer. But when he hits threes, the way that he hit threes in that first quarter, and look, he didn't make a ton after, he only made one more after that, and still, you know, still only took, I think, six threes, five threes, something like that. He, it's not like he's taking a huge volume. But just those two were enough to change the Magic defense. They started switching after that. And that's when Mobley went to the block. That's when they started running those pick and rolls to the empty corner. That's the adjustment that the Cavs forced the Magic to make. They had to, they had to leave plan A and go to plan B. And that's, that's such a huge factor in, in a series like this. That's such a huge factor in these games is, you know, the Magic felt like schematically, game plan-wise, they did a lot of good things. Could they tighten some things up? Sure, absolutely, 100%. But Evan Mobley forced the Magic to go from their first plan to their second plan to say, okay, this isn't working. Let's go to the next thing. Let's do the next thing. That's a huge deal. And while, you know, Look, Evan Mobley had 16 points, got about his season averages. Uh, 16 points, like 11 rebounds, like about his season averages. He still made the magic change. And so if we're looking for why the Cavs were able to be in control of this game, and, you know, you know something we're going to look forward to to game two is, okay, do the magic trust him to do that again? And, and, and that was the message. I went back and listened to Cleveland Sound. That was the message from Cleveland after this game. It's like, those threes from Evan Mobley were a big deal. But now he's got to do it again. Now he's got to do it again. He's got to do it three more times. And so, this is what a series is. It's the bets you make and whether the other team makes you pay for making those bets. Whether they, whether you win or lose those bets. Again, Cleveland is betting that they can wall off Paolo Bancaro, make him a jump shooter, and force others to make shots. Like, that's that's the deal. That's the game. You know, Matt, like, the Magic are not going to win a game if they don't at least keep Cleveland honest with their shooting. They're going to have to make some threes early. Um, preview for our next segment. The Magic are betting that, essentially, that Jalen Suggs will lock out Darius Garland. And until the very end of the game, I, I think he did a good job. You know, Garland got assists. He, he, he got the ball moving. Um, Suggs was a little bit too too much going for steals. You know, these are details the Magic have to get down, but the Magic essentially bet we will lock out Darius Garland. Don Mitchell will get his. Gary Harris will be an impediment, but he'll get his. And we'll keep Mobley on the perimeter. We'll help off of Mobley. Well, Mobley made them pay for that in, on Saturday. Will the Magic give him the opportunity to make them pay for it again on Monday Or are they going to mix things up? Are they going to do something different? What new bet are they going to make? Evan Mobley won that gamble. You know, again, that you know, the Magic, I think, exited this game feeling pretty good about their defense. Honestly, feeling pretty good that if they make shots, that they will that they'll they'll be competitive and they'll win. The question is, can Cleveland get the same production, the same spacing they got from Evan Mobley? It's a big thing for them. And forced the first adjustment in game one. And that's a big reason why Cleveland ended up winning that game. When we come back, we will chat about keys to game two. You can guess what they are. We're going to give you some numbers coming up here in just a moment. But first, it's time for a quick word from our friends over at Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more players, stats, and watch the winnings roll in. The playoffs have begun, and you can get in on the action and win up to 100 times your money on prize picks as you and the world's best players take the game to a new level during the playoffs. 
You can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little, with as, little as four correct picks. You can turn $10 into $1,000 with basketball, hockey, and plenty more entries today on prize picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Again, all you have to do is pick more than or less than, and it's really that simple. Before they were kicked out of Florida, which bring them back to Florida, please, prize picks was my go-to fantasy game. There was no complicated salary caps, no complicated scoring system. It was just more than or less than. Fairly, fairly simple, and it's just you versus the numbers. You're not in these giant player pools just hoping to get your money back. Prize picks gives you your it's it's all about you and what and your picks gives you gives you such a good chance to feel like you're a winner at the very least. Download the app today and use code locked on NBA for your first deposit match of up to one hundred dollars. Again, go to price go to go to the Price Picks app. Da- use the code locked on NBA for a first deposit match of up to one hundred dollars. Price Picks pick more, pick less. It's that easy. All right, game two tonight at Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse as the Orlando Magic taking on the Cleveland Cavaliers once again. That's how these series work. We're going to get very comfortable, very used to these Cavaliers teams. And look, like I said, this game is going to come down to the bets that the Magic make, the bets that the Cavs make, you know, what they're willing to give up and whether the whether the teams are able to take advantage of it. And, you know, again, you look at game one, you can boil it down to something simple. The bet that the Magic were willing to make with the Cavs was that Evan Mobley wasn't going to be able to hit outside shots. He made some outside shots, forced the Magic to change things, put the Magic in a little bit of a hole, it cost them a little bit, and the Magic were never able to get out because the bet that the Cavs made did not pay off. And it's really, the numbers are just shockingly simple. Um, I like to do this after bad shooting games. I go to the NBA.com shot dashboard. They track, they have a tracking stat that tracks, you know, percentages when the defender is... You know, a certain de- when the closest defender is a certain number of feet away, they categorize open shots as when the defender is closer than four to is when the defender is four to six feet away. The Magic went eight for thirty-seven from three in the game. You know, again, Cleveland also made eight threes. I-, I think we'll see a different kind of game, but here is the number that matters. The Magic went three for twelve when the closest defender was four to six feet away. Three for twelve, not a great percentage. It's twenty-five percent. They were 5 for 23. 5 for 23. I'm not even going to do the math on that. When the closest defender was 6 plus feet away. They were 8 for 34, eight for 35 then on quote unquote open threes. 6 plus feet away is wide open. We'll just categorize it. When the closest defender was 4 or more feet away, the Magic were 8 for 35 on threes. They only took 37 three-point attempts. This tells you that at least by the numbers... The Magic largely took good three-pointers. And, you know, Jalen Suggs said this after practice Sunday. Most of his shots were, they weren't left, they weren't right, they were dead center, and they rimmed out, or they, they missed for whatever reason. If the Magic are quietly confident, it's because they truly believe, and maybe the numbers back this up, maybe they don't, they truly believe they got good shots and they missed them. And if the Magic just shoot it a little bit better, Everything opens up. Again, it's it's the same thing that happened with Evan Mobley. Evan Mobley makes a couple of quick threes early in the game. All of a sudden, the Magic have to shift their defense a little bit. They have to change their strategy a little bit. And everything opens up for Donovan Mitchell to get downhill, for Darius Garland to get downhill a little bit, for you know Evan Mobley to, to pin guys down on the paint because the Magic are starting to switch. It changes the game. If you want Paolo Bancaro or Franz Wagner to get to the basket more, make a few threes. Make it dip more difficult for the defenders to leave their man. And essentially, this is the gamble that the Cavs are making. Every game is going to be about this. Like, I, I wish I had a more simple process or simple explanation. But man, and this is the way it's been all year. I've done this stat analysis so many times this year. The Magic just got to make a freaking open shot. If the Magic make their open shots, they are going to win. It's It's that simple. And whether that's nerves, whether that's the defense is closing out a little bit better, so maybe that four to six feet isn't really four to six feet. Uh, maybe the ball isn't passed to you know in, on time on target. Whatever the case may be, and thirty-seven threes is way too much, too much for the Magic. They need to be low thirties. You know, Cleveland took thirty threes. That's about the number the Magic need to be at too. Um, that tells me they're not getting to the paint. They they got thirty free throws. Like the Magic did a lot of really good things. Um, they got to make shots, and and that just loosens everything up. Now. We are expecting Cleveland to make shots too. They were 5-for-5 five five to start the game. 
missed their next 19 threes. Um, so they're not going to have a game like that again. They're not going to be, they're not going to start off that hot again, probably. They're also not going to be that cold. They'll make threes throughout the course of the game. But for their part, Cleveland shot eight for 30, two for 10 when the closest defender was four to six feet away, four for 10 when the closest defender was six plus feet away. Four for 10 is certainly a lot more respectable um, percentage. And that makes them six for 20 on their quote unquote open threes. Six for 20. And so that tells me that a Cleveland, you know, didn't get a lot of open threes, but they took some heavily contested threes and missed them. They were two for 10, uh, two for 10 on, on other threes otherwise. But it also tells me Cleveland made the open threes that they got. And again, if Orlando shoots 40% on 23 threes, you know, let me let me do that. I'll, I will do that math for you real fast. If they, they shoot 40% on 23 threes, that's nine three-pointers. That, that'd be nine, 9.2 three-pointers. So let's give them nine. That's four three-pointers. That's 12 points that the Magic didn't get in a 14-point game. Do the math. I'll let you do the math there. I wish there was something more complicated to say than this. But the Magic need to make shots. The other key that I'm watching in this game is pace. And Cleveland, I think, did a really good job of this. And Orlando was not nearly as effective. But this is something that I anticipated throughout the series, too. It's not that either of these teams have to be fast-breaking teams and get a lot of points in transition. But when they get stops and the, def- and, and the defense is waiting to get set, you got to get down the court quickly. Um, you got to be able to get into your offense quicker in this series because you're not scoring on either team's set defense. Um, that was the case throughout game, game one. Um, you're not scoring when, you have the chan- when these teams have the chance to get their defense set. They're too, you know, we could say everything we want to say about the Magic and their game one performance. We cannot say that they were not prepared. And we cannot say that they they didn't show up. Their defense showed up. They played some fantastic defense throughout the course of the game. And, you know, they matched, you know, they were, they didn't shrink from the stage. They may have missed shots. There might have been some nerves there, but they, you know, they missed shots all year. We, we've had this conversation a million times this year. They did not shrink physically from the Cavs. The Cavs wanted to be physical. The Magic said, great, we'll, we'll match you. Maybe it took the Magic a, a quarter and a half to get there. Um, to really understand what playoff physicality was like. But once they got there, they got there. Um, I don't anticipate that changing. Um, you're not scoring in the half court in this in this series. You know, the team, you know, you're not. You've got to be able to get down the court before the defense gets set and create a little bit of confusion. You create a little bit of confusion, that's how you get space. And the best way to create confusion is to get there before they can get organized. Force them into cross matches, force them into mismatches. That's how you beat a good defensive team. And, you know, Orlando's got to do a better job just creating some movement, creating some, you know, again, it's, it's not so much stats things. They got to make shots. Like, that's that's a stat thing. They got to create some movement. They got to create uh, create guys just kind of moving around, forcing the defense to react and make decisions. That's what this series is coming down to. Again, it's, it's so much about details. You know, free throws, yes, make free throws, all those things. It's about decisions. It's about forcing the te- forcing your opponent to make decisions and understand and, and make compromise decisions. Um, make them make compromises. That's that's what that's what that's all you're doing with adjustments. Like you know, we can say all say all we want, but like you know, the Magic made a conscious decision of helping off of Evan Mobley. The Cavs understood that a compromise decision. Mobley made them pay. The Cavs put five feet in the paint, put three guys on Paolo Bancaro to wall him up so he couldn't get to the basket. Um, he tried kicking out to shooters. Guys were in the wrong spot. Passers weren't on target. They missed open threes. They won that bet. Again, this is all this this all this series all this series is series is is what can, you know we're going to take away your pet thing. What are we giving up to take away away from it? What are we willing to give up and allow you to beat us with? Remember 2020 Milwaukee. The Bucks were perfectly cool with Gary Clark taking threes. He made four threes in Game One. The Magic won that game. Milwaukee said, we don't think you can do that again. They didn't change a thing. They won the series in five. That's probably not going to happen with Evan Mobley, but I also don't think we're going to see Evan Mobley make two or three threes or shoot as many threes again. Certainly not the way that they shot early in that that game. That may be a bet the Magic are willing to make again. We'll see what adjustments they make in game two. The key to game two, though, it it sucks that it's this simple. The Magic got to make shots. If the Magic makes shots... They're going to be in business. If the Magic don't make shots, it's going to be another long, frustrating night. That's just plain and simple. 
But that's going to do it for me today. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. Go find me on Twitter at Philip R underscore OMD. Subscribe to the podcast and Apple Podcasts. Switch your tune in. Himalaya, Google Play, Spotify, Odyssey, and all of them. Send the podcast to your podcast enable listening device. You can, also check, you can also check us out on YouTube. Search for Locked on Magic on YouTube. For the latest on the Orlando Magic, be sure to check out orlandomagicdaily.com. You can find us there on Twitter at omagicdaily. Get game updates as well on from there. And be sure to check out my Patreon page, the Orlando Magic Hub. You can find that at patreon.com slash Orlando Magic Hub for even more Magic content. I did a video breakdown of some plays and talked a little bit about how the Magic can create space uh, create space in a playbook video there as well from Saturday. You can check that out again at patreon.com slash Orlando Magic Hub. And as always, thank you for your support. That's going to do it for me today, though. I want to thank you all again for listening to today's episode of Locked on Magic. Now that you're done with us, be sure to check out the Locked on Sports Today 24-7 streaming channel on YouTube and now available on Amazon Fire TV and the free Fire TV channels app. Locked on Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked on, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked on Sports Today now available on the free Fire TV channels app. Once again, that's going to do it for me today here on Locked on Magic. We'll be back tomorrow to recap game two between the Magic and the Cavs before I head back home to Orlando. But until then, for Orlando Magic Daily and Locked on Magic, this has been Philip Rossman-Reich. We'll see you all again next time for another episode of Locked on Magic.